Um, so we actually went through a lot of trouble to try to perfect immunohistochemistry to detect TLR4. This is a normal uh, colon, uh, you know, normal colon little tubes. Uh, there are occasional scattered TLR4 positive cells, in this case in the lamina propria. This is a UC cancer uh, where, again, the epithelium appears to be what is strongly expressing TLR4, another example of that. Um, and this is an area where you can see a clear transition. These are relatively normal appearing crypts, and as these crypts become more dysplastic, they're expressing more TLR4. So we wanted to know, can we model this in an animal? So uh, in the uh, field of cancer, I was uh, actually talking to Grace Chen, who works uh, as an oncologist who works with Gabe Nunez. Uh, people who really are colon cancer people hate all the animal models of, of, of cancer because, you know, they're always, no animal model fully recapitulates um, the, the uh, human disease, but nevertheless you have to start somewhere. So what we did was we used an, a very well-established animal model where the animals are given a shot of a genotoxic agent called azoxymethane that intercalates into the DNA, at least in the background of mice that we're using, which is B6, that doesn't spontaneously call tumor, cause tumorigenesis, but then you chase it with two rounds of dextran sodium sulfate, which causes inflammation, and these animals go on to develop polyposis. And you can see that on our colonoscopy pictures, the mice are very, very compliant. Um, we get them to sign uh, consents, and then we, uh, we put them in the same position each time, and you can see the progression of these, of these uh, polyps, of these masses, okay? So then the question was, do these express TLR4 like the human, like the humans do? And the answer is yes. Um, and you can see here, uh, this is a tumor from one of these mice. Again, we did the Western blot with matched samples of surrounding mucosa, non-dysplastic, and, and the tumor. And you can see that TLR4 is more highly expressed. Okay. So then, uh, okay. So now we have a model that we think is pretty good. Um, TLR4 is overexpressed when these animals develop, de go on to develop. Uh, this colitis associated, I'll say neoplasia, they don't really get cancer, so it wouldn't be fair to call it cancer. And so we asked the question, what happens if you don't have TLR4? So if, in a wild type mouse, mouse, you do what I just told you, AOM, DSS, these are two different mice, you can see extensive polyposis in both examples. Um, if you start with a TLR4 knockout mouse, uh, really for all intents and purposes, they, they hardly develop any tumors. And the ones that they do develop are very, very tiny and only microscopic. So this is actually a focus of dysplasia. But to the naked eye, there are no macroscopically visible tumors, leading us to believe that TLR4, at least in this model, is both necessary for the initiation of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an nascent tumor as well as for the growth of that tumor. Um, all right, so, so here, again, we're left with this idea of TLR4 being important for all the steps that I mentioned earlier. But it led us to now a different question. Well, which cell type is driving this carcinogenic process? Which is driving it? Which TLR4 expressing uh, cell is driving it? Is it the epithelium? Or we know that there's a rich population of tumor-associated macrophages juxtaposed to these cells. Are they feeding the epithelium uh, to then you know, promote the growth of that tumor? So you, you saw from some of the pictures that it looked, at least uh, by immunohistochemistry, that the TLR4 was happening on the, ep on the epithelial side. But at the time, that seemed a little bit like anathema. If you go back a couple of years when we started this, TLR4 expression in the normal situation is very low. So, so we, um, you know, we, had, we, we actually did a lot of work. It's been published where we did bone marrow chimeras also. So we can mix and match you know, epithelium and stroma with a different immune system, right? So you could take a TLR4 knockout, give it wild-type bone marrow, and take a wild-type mice, give it TLR4 knockout bone marrow. And it led us to believe that it was the epithelial expression of TLR4 that was important. So that's by way of background, all right? So what we decided to do was model that in an animal model. Okay, so we made the following mouse. We made a transgenic mouse that expresses TLR4 and actually a constitutively active TLR4 under the control of something called the villain promoter. And this villain promoter is used to drive expression of a gene, whatever your gene of interest is, in the intestinal epithelium. And it does so pretty much from stem to stern, from duodenum at least to, uh, to, the, uh, to the colon, more on the right side, but even to some extent on the left side. Uh, I'm afraid of Linda and Deb asking me whether it does so in the stomach because we really haven't looked. But in any case, um, this is, uh, you know, by real-time PCR, 
Um, the the uh, trans gene has CD4 on it, so we actually stained for CD4. And you can see that this is the control mouse, this is the mouse that's the transgenic mouse. So we get a high level of expression of our trans gene throughout the epithelium of the gut. All right? And so when we do that, when we, now we have a mouse that is, is like has, we've turned up the volume on TLR signaling throughout the gut. So what happened? What happened? Well, um, the first thing we noticed is that they actually have a great deal more proliferation. This is back to those BRDU stains. You can see a wild type mouse uh, with a certain amount of BRDU staining in the, in the crypts. But this is just at baseline. We didn't do anything. We didn't DSS them. We've done nothing. We've just looked at them. And you can see that throughout the intestine, there's an, a, a, a differential where there's an increase in proliferation in uh, the villain TLR4 mice. Okay? Suggesting that just driving TLR signaling, turning up the volume on TLR signaling, is uh, sufficient, actually, to induce proliferation of epithelial cells, which is, I think, kind of neat. Um, the only in, in sort of the tumor world, spontaneous phenotype these mice have is that they develop duodenal adenomas 100% of the time, both in New York and in Miami, and I'm happy to have them come to Michigan and see if they get them here, but they all develop duodenal adenomas by a few weeks of age. And if someone has any thoughts on why that is, I'd love to hear them. Um, it isn't because they express a higher level of the trans gene. Uh, there than any place else. So we're still kind of working on that. Um, when you look at these duodenal adenomas, um, there is an infiltrate of COX-2 expressing macrophages associated with these adenomas. So these are being, I'll say recruited, but I don't, I'm not sure that that's the right word. They might be resident macrophages that have been that have been induced to express COX-2. And that'll be another interesting thing to try to dice. Duodenal adenomas um, there is an infiltrate of COX-2 expressing macrophages associated with these adenomas. So these are being, I'll say recruited, but I don't, I'm not sure that that's the right word. They might be resident macrophages that have been, that have been induced to express COX-2. And that'll be another interesting thing to try to dissect. Estrogen species to cause more DNA damage is highly expressed in the epithelium. So actually this is based on just isolating epithelial cells in the duodenum, not from the tumor itself, but in the surrounding epithelial cells. There's also a somewhat increased production of TNF-alpha. Um, we then asked whether this is related to beta-catenin. Um, you can see that in areas of, of high-grade dysplasia, there's a lot more beta-catenin expression, and actually there's a lot of nuclear beta-catenin, right? Beta-catenin is the downstream target of the APC, of the APC WINT pathway. But we weren't, you know, weren't necessarily happy with this because immunohistochemistry, everyone hates it. Oh, how do you really know it's nuclear, yada, yada, yada. So what we did was we took duodenal epithelial cells from not the tumor, but the surrounding duodenum. And we actually did nuclear extracts, nuclear protein extracts. Not, we got rid of the cytoplasm and just dealt with the nucleus and compared the transgenic mice to a wild-type litter mate. And this is staining for beta-catenin. So you can see that there's an increase in nuclear, you know, i.e. where you want it to actually have a biological effect, nuclear beta-catenin in mice that, uh, in our transgenic TLR4 expressing mice. Okay, so again, this suggests that uh, TLR4 in some way, possibly not necessarily directly, is linked to a very important pathway uh, for cellular replication in, in the du du duodenum, and actually we have very similar results in the colon as well. Um, when we gave them DSS to, to kind of do the experiment that we started out in the first place, right, which is to see are these animals more susceptible to the development of, of colitis-associated cancer, they're highly susceptible to the DSS itself. In other words, you give them DSS and they have a very severe inflammatory response and you, we've had to actually make a lot of modifications to our protocols because we kill them if we give them the same concentration of DSS as our wild type mice. But the mice that have survived have extensive uh, uh, dysplasia. So this is a wild type mouse because we had to sacrifice them early because the other ones were dying. 